This photo makes me look like I'm a Hollywood film director or something. It's <laughs> hilarious to me. My, uh, uh, my brother-in-law served in Vietnam <clears throat> and um, for, he was there for a year in deployment. This was, uh, of course, a long time ago, so they didn't have all the benefits of modern technology. And my sister gave birth to their firstborn a month after he was deployed. And I want to give this picture to you. She, she sent him at least one or several photos of the baby and mother um, every day for a year. And he would plaster the walls of the place where he was staying when he was not traveling um, just to remind him of the reality back home because in the reality he was in, it was obviously a very, very different kind of experience. And she sent him a cassette. Some of you remember cassettes? <laughs> yeah, don't raise your hand. It's going to give, uh, betray your age. But uh, a little cassette on, uh, of sounds of that little girl, Tamalin, every day for the entire time he was deployed. I don't know, there's something so beautiful about that picture of of those two worlds kind of being uh, integrated in that particular way. And I was there when he got off the plane. I wasn't planning on this. Um, to meet his daughter for the first time when she was almost a year old. Thought, wow, what a privilege it was to see and witness that beauty. Anyway, I did her wedding years later. I baptized a bunch of her kids. You know, you know how this goes. I did the wedding of one of her children, actually both of her sons. So I, I've really uh, benefited a lot from being in that family system. Um, I'll read the text about a third of the way through the sermon, so don't panic. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray it in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's weird how I get older. I'm quicker to tears all the time. My brother-in-law, Jack, who was in Vietnam, same way that our kids and our grandkids mock us all the time. We're just sort of sops now. We're so <laughs> pathetically sentimental. A brief story, and it'll make sense as we go along. When I was young, and started elementary school, I had a reading disability and I didn't know what nobody else did. There were no diagnosed, di diagnostic tools back in those days, no reading specialists and other things like that. So I just kind of suffered along. And by the time I was in the sixth grade, I was reading at about a first grade level. It was very difficult back then. Uh, my uh, sixth grade teacher, Miss Baker, I have no fond memories of her at all. <laughs> um, called me stupid in class, and at, once, at one point said, you will never have a chance of getting into college. Boy, was she wrong. <laughs> nah, 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 no, I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that. Anyway, so I developed a narrative early on in my brain that I was stupid. And even after I began to learn how to read, I kind of untangled my own brain when I was in uh, late high school and college, and got things figured out. Uh, I, I carried that with me well into my 20s and even my 30s. It's interesting how these narratives that we form about ourselves can persist over a really, really long period of time. You know, you're kind of an ugly duckling when you're in junior high. Actually, most people are ugly ducklings in junior high. And you can get at this image of yourself, I'm homely, I'm ugly. And that can carry on for years and years. Now, I want you to remember this. These narratives that we form in our own brains about ourselves that help make sense out of the world around us. They can be positive, they can be negative. I mean, some people grow up thinking they're stupid when they're really not. And there are other people that think they're smart and they're not nearly as smart as they think they are. And over time, life has a tendency of kind of leveling those things out. <clears throat> so I want you to uh, think for a few moments about some of the narratives that you've developed in your own mind that makes sense out of the world around you and your place in it, all right? Here are just a few examples. I'm stupid or I'm smart. Uh, it's all up to me. 
I'm the only responsible person in the room. I, in fact, I thought during the baptism when water spilled over, there are people in this room that are thinking, who's going to clean that up? I was not one of them, by the way. Not my narrative. I can't, and therefore I won't, ever. Life is about me. I need to be the center of attention. I have to be beautiful and perfect all the time. Even when I'm 80, I have to be beautiful and perfect. Why can't I catch a break? I must succeed. If people knew who I really am, they would want nothing to do with me. Life is competition. I aim to win. I can't ever let down my, my guard. I don't matter. If I don't medicate myself one way or another, I won't survive. I can pretty much do anything I set my mind to. Now, as I said, these narratives aren't necessarily negative all the time or positive, but I will tell you this. Every one of the narratives that we form in our brain that keep playing like a tape, uh, in the end, will all fail. All of them. Because they're not true to reality as God defines it. Life's gonna stop working. Those narratives are gonna trail off. We're gonna wonder if God is there and we're gonna enter a period of crisis. I can't tell you how difficult this is for people. I've lived a lot of years now, 73 years, and I've seen so many people face this brutal moment in their lives where those narratives simply stop working. Uh, one sociologist, modern social theorist, calls it hitting the wall. And you can't get over it, you can't go around it, you can't get through it, you just hit the wall. A famous 16th century uh, mystic, John of the Cross, called it entering the dark night of the soul. That's a really great phrase, a horrible phrase, the dark night of the soul. And he's not talking about just depression there. He's describing a phase of life in which our narratives, healthy or not, stop working. They no longer make sense of the world. And we come to the end of ourselves. Faith turns flat. God seems to withdraw. Our souls descend into darkness. We've entered, entered or we've hit the wall. Now, what causes this? Well, a thousand variations on the same theme. Could be a loss we go through. Uh, could be an addiction that we can't kick. A severe trouble in our homes, our marriages, or with a child, or more than one child, a wayward child. Mental health issue. And sometimes it's just life itself. You know, I raised three kids by myself for 20 years. And it just wore me down. You know, at 12 or at 5 o'clock when I'm trying to make dinner, they just do nothing but fight. And after a while, it just exhausts you. Or it could be uh, erosion of the spirit through rejection or disillusionment or abandonment or despair. Now, the story of Joseph has always been one of my favorites. Uh, it, it's an astonishing story when you think about it and is full of just power and meaning. The problem with this story is that we can read it in a half hour. So it's kind of sweet and sentimental to us. We get done reading it and we're smiling. The problem is Joseph wasn't reading it. He was living it. And it unfolded over years. It was a really hard and harsh story. You know, I, I think to myself, what was it like for this man to be betrayed by his own brothers, to be sold as a slave in a foreign country and have to learn a new language, to be betrayed again by his master and his master's wife, to spend years in an Egyptian prison, to be utterly forsaken and forgotten before all of a sudden, out of nowhere, He's released from prison, promoted to second in command over the nation of Egypt, 
presiding over a food program first in years of plenty, then in years of famine, and finally to be reconciled with his brothers and to meet his father again after probably 25 years. This story is so wild, no one could have made it up. We read it, Joseph had to experience it. Brief synopsis, so Joseph is the 11th born of 12 sons. Uh, and the firstborn from his father's favorite wife, Rachel. His father's wife, uh, name, by the way, was Jacob. And <clears throat> he was the favored son, and his father demonstrated it in ways that infuriated his brothers. Uh, we're here talking about the famous multicolored coat that uh, his father uh, had made for only Joseph, which of course would make him uh, an easy target for jealousy and envy of hatred from his older brothers who weren't treated with the same kind of favor. Joseph only exacerbated the problem when twice over he had dreams and in the dreams his brothers were bowing down and worshiping him and he was stupid enough to actually tell his brothers those dreams. <clears throat> you tell me how his brothers responded. Well, one day, his brothers are out tending their flocks and herds somewhere, and Jacob approaches Joseph and said, will you go out and do a reconnaissance mission to see how they're doing? His brothers, of course, would have immediately translated this as spying on them. Well, when they see Joseph coming at a distance, they hatch a plot to seize him and murder him. They hate the man so much. Reuben, the firstborn, and realizes he's the one responsible for Joseph's welfare and safety, says, why don't we just drop him into a, a well that's dry and figure out what to do with him later on. Of course, he's imagining that they're going to be distracted. He's going to be able to pull Joseph out of the well and send him home. Well, Reuben has to leave, and while he's gone, a, a caravan of Midianite traders pass by the well and the brothers, and they decide, why don't we sell Joseph as a slave to Egypt and pocket the money, and then we get two wins instead of one. We get rid of our brother, and we get some cash in our pockets. And that's exactly what they did. Well, Reuben returns later on and realizes much to his horror that his brother has been sold as a slave. Uh, they don't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. So they decide to take his multicolored coat, of course they had stripped that from him, and tear it and dip it in animal blood and bring it back to Jacob, their father, and say, look at what we found. Of course, Jacob came to the conclusion that wild animals had killed his favorite son. And as he said, I want to descend to Sheol and there I want to remain. Well, Joseph is sold in Egypt uh, to the house of a, uh, an official in Pharaoh's court who's actually head of Pharaoh's guard named Potiphar. And there Joseph begins to work and serve. Um, <clears throat> his fortunes rise. He's so responsible and so virtuous that he eventually commands basically the entire house. In fact, the only thing not under Potiphar's, uh, Joseph's charge is Potiphar's wife. Well, Potiphar's wife takes an interest in Joseph. He's handsome and young and strong. And every day she begins to nip and nag at him, hoping to seduce him. Now, Joseph has matured, and he says finally to Potiphar's wife, no, I cannot, I cannot yield uh, to your demands. I couldn't do this to my God, and I could not betray my master. Well, she is infuriated by this rejection. Later on, when they're only, only Joseph and, his, and Potiphar's wife are in the house, she tries to seduce him. He resists her, and she grabs a piece of his clothing as he flees out of the house. She brings the clothing to Potiphar, her husband, and said, Joseph has been trying to attack me. I fended him off, and I'm holding this piece of clothing as evidence of it. Potiphar is furious and tosses Joseph into prison. 
and he remains in prison for years. Well, his fortunes again begin to rise until he becomes responsible for all of the prisons in this prison that's only for people who belong to Pharaoh's court. Well, now we're going to have the incident of the story that I'm going to tell, except I'm going to quickly give you the outcome. Eventually, Joseph is released from prison, but in a uh, and, and a wild coincidence, he actually becomes second in command over all of Egypt. He presides over the storage of grain during years of plenty. He distributes the grain during years of famine. He's eventually reconciled with his brothers, whom he forgives, sees his father and younger brother Benjamin again, and eventually moves 70 members of the family from what we now call the Holy Land down to Egypt, where they remain for some 400 years. Now, with that in the background, <clears throat> I want to mention briefly what I believe was the darkest hour of Joseph's life. The breaking point, the wall, the dark night of the soul. <clears throat> here's, the, here's the passage. And I want you to listen for two words, the word remember and the word forget. Remember and forget. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker offended their lord, the king of Egypt. A cupbearer was like a wine steward or a butler who would serve uh, wine and beverages to the, to the Pharaoh and his court. And he always had to taste everything first just in case it was poisoned. Then he would die. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he waited on them, and they continued for some time in custody. One night, they both dreamed the cupbearer and the baker uh, of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we've had dreams. And there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Well, in my dream, there was a vine before me. And on the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office and you, shall, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to when you were his cupbearer. But remember me when it is well with you. Please do, not, uh, please do me the kindness to make mention of me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this place. For in fact, I was stolen out of the land of Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should have put me into this dungeon. He is innocent, you know. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. 
Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a pole and the birds of the air will, f will eat flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the, chief of the, uh, and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his cupbearing and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But the chief baker, he hanged. Just as Joseph had interpreted them, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him. Well, the story is pretty straightforward, isn't it? Joseph's been in prison for years. Two officials from Pharaoh's court are tossed into prison for some impropriety. And they have dreams. Joseph, of course, is in charge of them. He says, my God can interpret the dream. He interprets them correctly. Uh, the butler or cupbearer is restored to his former position and once again serves in Pharaoh's court. Uh, the baker is, uh, is executed. Joseph says to the cupbearer, remember me when you go before Pharaoh. Uh, I'm in here. Uh, I'm innocent of the charges leveled against me. Um, I've been betrayed before remember me. And in a devastating line in this story, it says, the cupbearer forgot. Now, I want you to get inside Joseph's head and listen to his self-talk at this moment. Okay? Listen to it. We all self-talk. You know that. We all carry on a conversation inside our head about our spouses, our jobs, our bosses, maybe about this sermon right now. We all do this. Well, let's see what Joseph is saying to himself right after the butler and baker were released from prison. Okay, I was a brat, I admit it. My brothers still did me wrong. They betrayed me. But I have remained responsible loyal, upright, and faithful to God. I served my master well. I resisted the advances of his wife. I responded in faith when betrayed, yet again, and tossed into prison. But God has been with me. I know he will act to set me free. This is how God blesses those who do the right thing my hour of deliverance has come. Joseph sits in his cell and he smiles. He looks toward heaven and whispers a thank you to God. He marvels at God's glorious plan then unfolding to grant him freedom and a second chance in life. He imagines what life is going to be like outside prison after all these years. Is he going to become a citizen of Egypt? Marry a nice Egyptian girl? Have some kids? Maybe, maybe. Get a job as in a low administrative position in Pharaoh's court. I mean, why not? He interpreted this dream. Certainly the butler is going to speak well of him. I've finally been rid of the terrible injustice that my brothers inflicted on me. Good riddance to them. I get a chance to start over. His faith has prevailed. He has endured. His redemption is about to happen. And the butler forgets. How long did Joseph wait to figure that out? Think about that. Was it a week? Maybe a month? When did that first thought begin to sort of leak into his mind that the butler had forgotten and that he had been betrayed yet again? How long before he realized that for a third time 
his fortunes had turned south. How long before he concluded that even God had abandoned him? How long before he discovered that his last chance to gain freedom and live a normal life had come and gone? How long before he realized that God was simply not there for him? You know he was thinking that. Was it a month? Was it two months? Before he hit the wall and entered into the dark night of the soul. I cannot imagine a disillusionment greater than this. He could have given up on God right then and there, and he had every reason to. God had dangled freedom in front of Joseph's face, a face uh, awakening hope and longing, and then yanked it away from him like a sadistic and cruel parent. Joseph had remained faithful to God for so many years. And God had not returned the favor. Why trust God anymore? What would be gained by it? Listen to that self-talk now. God's a liar. God does not come through. I did my part. God didn't do his part. I am alone in the world. There's no one there for me, not even God. He remains in prison. He continues to suffer. All he knows is forsakenness. All he feels is anguish and pain. Now, the writer of this story has the audacity to say something to us, the readers, that Joseph doesn't know. Does that make sense to you? He's whispering something to us. He's saying, I need to tell you something. And Joseph didn't know it, but he had to figure it out. And this is a line repeated three times. And in all cases, it's when dark, Joseph was in the darkest moment of his life. And the Lord was with Joseph. And the Lord was with Joseph. Now listen. Joseph had no evidence at his immediate disposal that such was the case. None. That was an empty phrase in Joseph's mind. But of course, we know how the story turned out. Joseph didn't know. There's no way he could have known the truth. In fact, his imagination wasn't wild enough to be able to craft what really became the outcome to the whole story. Nobody is that creative and audacious. And yet that is exactly what happened. I am so drawn to this story because this depicts human experience for everybody sooner or later. Sometime or other, we travel blind. Sometime or the other, we hit the wall. Sometime we descend into the dark night of the, sto- uh, of the of our uh, dark night of the soul. And our imagination runs out of options and we don't know how it's going to turn out. This is a real human being here who lived in real time and space, who experienced real suffering and who felt betrayed by a real God. Is there a God? Is this God still at work in the world? Is this God for me? Or is there no God or an aloof God or even a cruel God? I'm sure Joseph asked every one of those questions. How could he not? Suffering forces us to ask those questions. Now listen. Joseph knew nothing of the future. He didn't know that two or three years later, the butler would hear that The Pharaoh had a dream that no one could interpret, not his advisors, not the wizards, not the magicians, no one. And you can just see this flash of memory in the butler's brain when he says, oh, I remember my faults today. Yeah, you better. (laughs) I, I, I knew this Hebrew in prison and he interpreted my dream and no one else could. Maybe. Maybe he can interpret this one. 
They summon Joseph. He takes a shower. They cut his hair. They put on nice Egyptian clothes. He's brought before the Pharaoh. And he not only can interpret the dream, dream correctly, he now has the capacity because of his maturity and his faith and his patience to advise the Pharaoh what to do. And the Pharaoh says, is there anyone who can take charge of what f the future holds for us? And he appoints Joseph. And of course, you know how the story unfolds. Joseph knew none of it. And if Joseph had been released from prison when he wanted and expected, according to the narrative that he had developed in his own mind, the story would have turned out, we think, great for Joseph, but for no one else. He might have, you know, married and had children and lived a decent job or had a decent job and lived a decent life in, uh, in Egypt. But Egypt would have starved. He never would have seen his brothers again, never been reconciled to them or had an encounter with his father. All because of a premature ending to the story that he wanted. Somehow, Joseph had just one seed of faith, like a mustard seed, and decided, I'm going to stay in this story. And he did. And look what happened as a result. One of the toughest decisions we will ever make in our lives is to stay in the redemptive story when there doesn't seem to be any more reason to. And we wait and we pray and we become alert to the crazy thing God is gonna do that seems so far beyond imagination it never enters our mind at all. This is not just Joseph's story. It's our story. Because all of us are going to have some version of the Joseph story happen to us. Maybe small, maybe big, maybe quick, maybe slow. It will happen. Three takeaways, very briefly. The first is <clears throat> that while we wait, we can remember. Memory, you know, has to do with the past. And all of us have in our stories somewhere, sometime, something that we could remember that reminds us of God's goodness. Somewhere. And if not our experience, then the experience of other people and certainly of the biblical story. The story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, the story of David, the story of Ruth, the story of Esther. Certainly the story of Jesus. Can you imagine a darker day than Good Friday? Do you realize the irony that we call it Good Friday? because nobody on Friday could have imagined a resurrection. And that's exactly what occurred. Memory. Uh, one of the things of practice as I followed for years is every Sunday morning, I spend a good half hour or more just reflecting on the past week or farther back and all the gifts that God has given to me. I thank God for my mother, a good woman, for some of my mentors, uh, for my wife, now gone 32 years, a daughter I lost. For my children, my stepchildren, my grandchildren, for opportunities I've been given. Ultimately, for just the goodness of God. I cultivate memory because memory keeps me in the story. Secondly, we need to have the courage to change the narrative to step out of the way we've made sense out of life and to realize God is much more capable of doing that than we are. To step into God's story, to step into God's narrative. And the third is to cultivate the discipline of waiting. Now, there are times to act. 
But there are times when there is simply nothing we can do but wait. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. On God alone my soul waits in silence. This event took place, what, almost 4,000 years ago? But it's happening to us right now. Remember these words. And the Lord was with Joseph and he's with us too. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please pray with me. Lord, sometimes we just admit it that faith comes hard. Sometimes we can hardly muster a mustard seed of it. And yet, <clears throat> to you, a mustard seed is good enough. So help us to cling to that mustard seed of faith. Some of us here are on the riding the crest of a wave and everything is working for us. And others of us have just entered the dark night of the soul. Regardless of where we are, keep reminding us that you are there for us and help us to stay in your story and out of the stories and walk away from the stories that we've used to make sense out of life. We pray through Christ, amen.